What's up, everybody? This is EvanForGrips.com, continuing with Project Get Me Stack. Today we have yet another fantastic question. You guys just keep on coming at me with them, and uh, it's great. It's great. You guys keep the goodness coming, so I can keep giving you some goodness, too. And today is a question entitled, How to Fold. Question that I think plagues so many beginner poker players out there because, well, we learn a lot from TV, and a lot of TV poker is tournament poker, and the strategies for tournament poker is a little different than the strategies for cash game poker. So we're gonna get into some nitty gritty in this video, and uh, I'm gonna help you guys out on being able to make those hero folds and those hero calls too. So. Here we go with the cue from Norway. Hi Evan, my name is Oystein and I have been playing poker for about three years. Online, however, I've only played for six months. I started out with just shy of $100 and I'm currently at $800. Nice. I grind six max, 25 NL hold'em at Poker Stars and have been doing it for some time. I started out two tabling and now I'm up to four. However, there are some drawbacks. Sometimes I feel like I don't put my opponent on a hand and then act accordingly. I only pay attention to my hand, and even though he shows massive strength, I might call two or three streets with top pair top kicker, because duh, you don't fold top top easily. How can I develop reads on multiple tables at the same time? Is this a matter of practicing? That if I keep multi-tabling, eventually my brain will cope with the stress of multiple decisions happening at once. Yeah. I also think that I have the Daniel Negreanu syndrome, where I call in spots my opponents are almost never bluffing. I'd much rather call than fold because they might be bluffing, but 90 plus percent of the time they're not. And unless you're getting 10 to 1 or better on your money, which most of the time you won't be, People don't bet that small on the river. Uh, you probably need to be making folds when they have it 90% of the time. Greetings, Oystein. And it's, do you know that feeling when you know you should fold, but you call anyway? And sure enough, they have the exact hand that you thought they would have, or one of the hands that they might have, but you say that's, that's what I put them on. It's really frustrating, right? And we hate to have that happen. So we got to learn. we got to get better. And I want to talk about a few things about the question before I get into the presentation. Some good points that Oystein made. Um, the first one is that awareness, awareness is key. And awareness about your opponent's hand mattering is very good. It's really good if you think about what your opponent might have. A lot of players never get past playing their own hand and only thinking about playing their hand, their hand, what the best way to play their hand is, what the best way to get the most money out of their hand is. And they never think about their opponent's hand or what their opponent might think their hand is, which really hurts their development as a player. It's important to be able to look beyond your hand. In fact, there are so many levels to this stuff, but that will probably be a topic for another video. In fact, I already have a question coming about that, so we'll cover that next time. You know, in the, in the email it says you don't fold top top easily, duh. And I think in TV poker, tournament poker, that's very true because generally in tournaments, stacks are shallower, um, pots are bigger relative to the stacks. So when you have top pair, especially top kicker, yeah, you can't fold that hand for 20 big blinds or sometimes even 30 big blinds. But when you're playing cash games for 100 big blinds, 200 big blinds, the ability to fold top pair, top kicker under the right circumstances is a very important skill to have in your arsenal. And um, being able to fold a strong hand as well as being able to call with a mediocre hand are key skills to being a successful player. You have to know how to do these things and be able to execute these things when the time is right. They're mainly a mix between hand reading, intuition, and a little bit of instinct. So you're saying, great Evan, how do I get those things? And I'll tell you, the best way to hone these skills is, surprise, surprise, experience. Putting in hands, practicing, thinking about what's going on. Um, 
But knowing what questions to ask while you're playing and while you're working on this skill can be helpful. So I will cover that in today's presentation. The first thing you want to do when learning when to hold them and when to fold them is get to know your opponents. Your opponents are, I want to say, 90% of your decision making. But I don't want to put a strict percentage on it since I don't know the exact number. It could be 60, it could be 72, it could be 94. I don't really know. Um, the main point that I want you to take from that little statement is that the way your opponents play is often, if not always, going to be much more important than your cards. An example would be, against a Maniac, you'd be more than happy to get in Jack's pre-flop. But against a super tight player, those pocket Jacks are definitely going into the muck if you get a lot of heat pre-flop. Same goes for post-flop. Against some players, you would never fold top pair, regardless of your kicker. Whereas against others, given the right action, over pairs, two pairs, even sets can become easy folds under the right circumstances. And you didn't hear me wrong. I said even sets can become easy folds under the right circumstances. And I'm not only talking about when the board runs out of four straight or a four flush. There are certain signs that you can get from your opponent that even a hand as strong as a flop set is no good and it can become like easiest fold ever. So, how can we get to know our opponents? Well, the first thing we need to do is pay attention to them. Figure them out, see what they're doing, and try to understand why they're doing what they're doing. So, what you need to do when you're playing a session, whether it's live poker, online poker, however many tables you're playing, and for this, the fewer the better, is pay attention to the action regardless of whether or not you're involved in the hand. Just because you don't have cards doesn't mean that poker is not being played and people are out there trying to outwit and outdo one another and taking actions for reasons. And there's information there to be gained that you can use later. So I want you to watch every action that goes on and try to figure out why people did what they did. And when you see something that's very uncharacteristic, very quote unquote unstandard, something unexpected, or just something straight up weird, take a note on it. Click the player note function and take a note on that uncharacteristic action because later on, um, if that person takes the same action again and you have a note that's, that tells you what they had when they did it, you're gonna have a big advantage, right? The next thing you wanna do is look for inconsistent actions because these are going to be kind of more indicative. They're going to reveal more about your opponent's hands than a regular action. And what I mean by an inconsistent action is when it kind of just like disrupts the natural flow of the hand. Like when the betting lead tries to get taken by someone else, like with a donk bet or, um, you know, a river lead out when a draw misses or something. These things that kind of, you know, you don't make sense when you would expect someone to just continue checking because that's what they've been doing all hand and suddenly they do something really different. It's really important to be like, what, what happened there? What's going on here? And try to figure it out. And when things don't make sense or they don't add up and you don't really buy what your opponent's trying to sell you or, you know, with the line he took and the action he took, you can't really figure out a hand, a real hand that he would actually do that with. It's probably because there isn't a hand that he would do that with and therefore they almost have to be bluffing. And in these, in these like situations, that's when you just go ahead and call because there's a really good likelihood that your opponent's bluffing. Um, you may sometimes be surprised at what they show up with and occasionally they'll have you know, caught a two outer on the river, which was the only thing that makes sense, but hey, all you have to do is make a note of that, and uh, next time you're in that situation, well, you'll know what to do because you'll have more information. And the best way to, to do this, to get good at this, is to play fewer tables and really just pay attention. Just focus in on what's going on and try to take a lot of notes. And the more notes you have, the better. 
And I think there's really no substitute for having good notes on your opponent. So if you aren't doing it, start doing it. And if you are taking notes right now, either try to take more notes or try taking better notes. Next concept, which is essential for knowing when to hold them and when to fold them, is the concept of relative hand strength as opposed to absolute hand strength. And I'm just going to introduce this briefly, but if you want more information on this, I think my video entitled Selection covers the concepts of relative versus absolute hand strength. So what are these things? Absolute hand strength is, you know, the name of your hand, a pair, two pair, flush, full house. Those are your absolute hand strengths. It's just the, the, the terminology for what you have. Relative hand strength, on the other hand, is your hand strength relative to your opponent or opponents. Is your hand better than theirs or is your hand worse than theirs? Because just because you have a flush, which some people would say is a good hand, doesn't necessarily mean you have a good hand if your opponent only plays big flushes and full houses and better, given what he's done. In that case, your absolute hand strength sounds pretty good. It's a flush. But your relative hand strength is quite bad. And relative hand strength is really the only one that matters. Whether you have a pair, an over pair, full house, flush, it, it just doesn't matter. It's cool terminology and it's cool to say like, hey, I know what this hand is and it makes me feel better about the game knowing that I can use that terminology, but it's not going to help you make better decisions at the table. What matters is whether or not you have a stronger hand than your opponent or opponents or a worse hand. What is the hand of your strength relative to them? A lot of people have hard and fast rules about what hands they simply cannot fold based on absolute hand strength. You know, like, I have top pair, top kicker. I'm never folding. It's just something I don't do. Well, what if you're up against the rock at the table who hasn't played a hand for the past five hours and suddenly makes a 4x open and is now betting pot on every street and you have top pair, top kicker on a jack high board? You still... You still don't fold top pair, top kicker? You know what I mean? Um, these rules, these hard and fast rules, really simply give players an excuse for not practicing their hand reading, and it will force their game to stagnate. So don't be one of those players. Don't have a strict set of rules that you follow. Always be willing to change things a little bit. And don't be lazy when it comes to figuring out what your opponent's hand is. Relative hand strength is so much more important than absolute hand strength, and it's something you want to be practicing all the time, including when you're not in a hand. When someone takes certain actions, what kind of hands, what strength of hands do they usually show up with? If you have notes on that, it's going to be much easier to gauge your relative hand strength when you're playing a pop versus them. Remember, it's always easier to take notes and to be objective when you are actually not involved in the hand, which is one of the reasons it's great to do that um, experiment or practice when you don't have cards. So, you know it takes skill to lay down a hand, but how can you develop it? Here are the key questions you need to ask when deciding how much action you are willing to give with a hand like top pair, top kicker, if we're talking absolute hand strengths or over pairs, and at what point you'll have to lay it down. Because you have to know when you're like, okay, I've put in enough money with this hand. I can't put in any more against this particular player. Um, and let's, let's look at the questions because this will give you a clear idea of what you need to think about. And it's only six questions. I'm not going to say that this is comprehensive, that this has everything, but it's a good place to start. And you can probably figure out what other questions to ask later. So the first one is, well, it's about our opponent. Is our opponent aggressive and reckless? Someone who just splashes chips in there and is always involved in the action? Well, if so, we're going to be able to call him down all the way with top pair, top kicker, most likely, if he's just bet, bet, betting. Uh, whereas if we're up against a passive or a weak, tight opponent who plays very few hands and is very selective about putting in his money and he holds on to that money really tight, then when he raises a bet of yours or is putting in a lot of action, 
hands like over pairs are not just automatic call call calls so really get to know your opponent um, uh, tracking software can help with this for online play but if you know his kind of standards for what hands he needs to put in a certain amount of money then you can gauge whether you have a strong enough hand in terms of relative strength to call them down all the way next question is how many bets went in preflop because and it's a good question because the more money that's gone in preflop, the lighter your requirements can be for stacking off. Or even just like calling down three streets. I remember in one of my original videos, which you can catch in the No Limit Hold'em Crash Course series, said that we don't go broke without the nuts in an unraised pot. And I think it's a decent, decent rule to go by against all but the, cra the craziest of players. And it's like in a raised pot, you know, now two pair is the standard for going broke. And in a, in a three bet pot, top pair, top top pair, top kicker is the standard for going broke. And in a four bet pot, well, any pair, any draw might become good enough to get it all in pre flop or all in on the flop with. And uh, the first reason for that is that you're getting better pot odds when you're dealing with a bigger pot. Uh, more money's gone in, so you're getting better odds on your money to stack off. And the other one is just that there are less of those sneaky hands that you have to worry about because in general uh, people will play a much wider range of hands for a limp preflop than they will for say calling a four bet so you don't have to be as worried about you know if you have ace king on an a6 three board you don't have to be as worried about someone having six three if it's a four bet pot as you would if it was a limp pot so the more bets that are have gone in preflop the lighter you can be the less strict you can be with your requirements for what hands you give action with. Uh, next question is how many players saw the flop? Because the more players who have seen the flop, more cards are out there in play. It's more likely that someone has connected with a board, any board. So uh, in a five-way pot, you just have to be a little more cautious with what hands you'll give action with than you would in, say, a heads-up pot. Then, then we look at board texture. You know, how closely connected are the cards on the board? What are the chances that someone has two pair sets, straights, flushes? And generally, people like to play cards closer in rank. So the more closer in rank the cards are on the flop, the more likely it is that people have two pair or straight draws. Yeah, I guess flush draws doesn't really matter for how close they are. But, you know, you can determine the likelihood of those dangerous hands being out there and be more cautious when you have top pair, top kicker, or an over pair. Uh, if the board's very scattered and the cards are very low and people aren't likely to play low pocket pairs, you can rule those out. You can feel much more confident about your top pair or over pair. And this is where, you know, hand reading is, is really just a skill that you have to work on. I can't just give you the rules and you'll be good to go. But next is how many bets have gone into the pot on the earlier streets and are likely to go into the pot because you know, people usually let you know by calling or by raising how much action they intend to put into a pot. And you want to decide early whether or not you're willing to go with them all the way to the bitter end and give them action. So if a lot of bets are likely to go into the pot, you want to have a stronger hand when you start get putting in that first action than you would if someone's probably just going to take one stab and be done with the pot. Um, generally, raises are indicative of more action coming, much more indicative of action coming than simple bets are. And things like just plain old C-bets, they don't mean all that much. You don't need to necessarily fear multiple barrels coming. Finally, the question to ask, mostly on the river, is what are your pot odds? And cover this in the triple threat video. But if someone bets half pot, I believe you're getting three to one on your money, you only have to be right 25% of the time. If someone bets like a ninth of the pot, you're getting 10 to one on your money. You only have to be right about 10% of the time. So the, the less someone's betting, the less often you have to be, the less often you have to show the best hand to be making a correct or profitable call. So pot odds matter a lot on the river, but all the other stuff comes first and should help you 
really create your plan early on so that you don't just find yourself on the river being like, oh, what now? If you think ahead, you're going to avoid a lot of difficulty and you're going to have a big advantage on the people who are not thinking ahead. And that wraps it up for the presentation, but I still have a couple of more things that I want to talk about because I think this is a really important topic and it's a really interesting topic and it's a really difficult topic. There's a lot of material on this out there. I myself have already created a lot of material on it and apparently that wasn't enough because people are still asking. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, multi-table. So I'm going to respond to the rest of Oystein's questions. The first one is that multi-tabling, you asked if it's going to improve your ability to read hands and to read multiple hands at the same time. And the answer in short is not really. Um, it'll get you more comfortable making decisions under pressure, but it won't necessarily make you better at making reads. Um, so a good exercise every once in a while is to one table or just two table and try to take notes on everything you can like everything possible just to get in the habit of it obviously for a good online player a good gamer multi-tabling is almost certainly going to be more profitable than one or two tabling so for any grinders out there that should be your go-to you really want to be putting in your volume where you can but there's no harm in mixing it up and just trying this exercise every once in a while it's also good for your brain <laughs> and the notes you take during these one or two tabling sessions may pay off in a big pot when you're multi-tabling um, because you have that extra info on your opponents to give you an edge and it's not like the notes you take when you're one tabling don't apply when you're 12 tabling so the more often you can do this exercise the more you're going to really be able to get to know your opponents and all these little nuances about them so that when you're playing your session, you have all these extra things you can have as your go-to that are going to make your decisions a lot easier and a lot more profitable. Now, finally, since the main question was, how do I fold? How do I fold a good hand? How do I fold a hand that's high in absolute strength, but I, I know is probably no good? First one is just trust your gut. If you feel like you're beat, you're probably beat. So just resist the temptation to try to find a reason to call or raise and just hit that F1 button or move your mouse to the side and click the fold button and don't take a while and, and talk yourself into it. When it comes to being inclined to call rather than fold, well, it's just human nature. We're curious beings as humans and we like to get information when we can rather than being left in the dark. It's, it's just the way we are. Think about like gossip. When you hear that someone's talking about something, you want to find out what it is. And everyone wants to know what it is. Even if it's like the stupidest thing ever, you just want to know what's going on. Um, so it's human nature and it's consistent with your desire to call. It's also why value betting is going to be a lot more profitable than bluffing. But it's our secret little, little bonus for you guys there. Um, as a poker player though, you have to like kind of trick your mind. Um, based on all the actions that your opponent has taken, you should be able to put them on a hand. That's, that's your skill as a poker player, is being able to put them on a hand. And once you've done this, you shouldn't need to call for confirmation. You should be content that you figured out your opponent's hand without having to invest that extra large river bet. Click the fold button and, you know... Give yourself a pat on the back for a job well done. That's it. When you when you properly assessed your opponent and you know that he has to have these hands to give this much action and your hand fits right here, then um, throw it away. Practice that fold. Maybe you just take a day practice that fold. Remember, bets are bigger on the river, so it's important that you're able to make proper laydowns at this critical junction in the game. Um, it's hard to make up those river bets. And if you know that you're beat, you just you just gotta trust your gut, fold, and know that you're showing skill when you're able to make a lead. And you're showing self-control, which a lot of players don't have, which is why there's a lot of money 
to be made in this game. Now I know that this presentation is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to hand reading and it's going to get you guys on the right track for knowing when to hold them and when to fold them. But for those of you who really want to get better at this skill, uh, if you haven't yet, I would recommend watching the No Limit Hold'em Crash Course, which really covers this stuff and the street by street play. And if you've watched it before, watch it again. Um, there's nothing like a good refresher. In fact, I think I'm going to watch it right now because it's just good to practice. But uh, that's those are my thoughts for how you can know when to fold a hand. I know it's a tough thing to get to get to terms with, but the sooner you have that ability in your arsenal, the sooner you're going to be saving that money on the river. And remember, a dollar saved is the exact same as a dollar earned. So making a good fold is just as valuable as making a hero call. Okay. So please let me know what you guys thought of the video. Leave me your comments and feedback below. I always love to hear from you guys. I've been seeing the comments go really crazy on the other videos, and it's like awesome. I love having that stuff to read when I get up in the morning. If you have any questions for Project Gemi Stacking, send them to evan at grips.com with the title Get Me Stacking, and hopefully I'll be able to answer your question and help you get stacking. Finally, if you're finding these videos helpful, you're enjoying these videos and you want to see more of them, or you just want to be the person who's first to get those releases, please subscribe to my channel below, show your support, and anytime I release a video, it will be like, bam, Grips is giving you more poker tips so that you can get stacked. And, uh, yeah, that about wraps it up. I hope you found the video informative. And I totally forgot to sign up that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I hope you found the video informative and insightful. This has been Evan for Grips.com. Peace.